once you are exposed to, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, NFT, you can't, you don't see the world the same, you know, wow. you can't unsee it. And the show is called Decentralized Dawn. And, you know, I like to hope that we're at the dawn of, you know, a more decentralized age and all movement towards that is, uh, is movement that I'm excited to see happen. Welcome to Decentralized Dawn, where lifelong friends, Chicago and Disco, navigate the ever-evolving crypto landscape. With genuine curiosity and a commitment to nuance as our North Star, we offer clear-eyed exploration. Our goal? To empower listeners with the tools and insights needed to flourish in this decentralized age. Here we go. Episode 5. Can you believe it? Uncharted waters to a degree with this one. It's uh, a slightly different format, but I'm I'm pretty excited to try to dive into this and dissect a little bit of a what's a pretty pretty large topic. So we we have our work cut out for us with this one, and uh, the overall topic that we're trying to dig into is just the essence of the decentralization movement. So buckle up. Yep. And for those of you who haven't seen a show yet, I'm Chicago over here to my left is Disco. Ahoy, I'm Disco to the screen left, I believe is what it's called, but I'm making that up. Stage left, if you will. Yep. We are childhood friends and uh, have been into crypto for a while and we are focusing on decentralization today. This is a big show. I'm both excited about it and I have to admit, after the fifth episode, a little trepidatious because when you start going down the rabbit hole of decentralization and looking at its roots and what it was defined, it, it's it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah, I think that I, I agree there's a slight intimidation to it. And I think that the notion of decentralization is just extremely appealing from a creative and artistic and individualistic and individualistic perspective. And I think that if you look at it, I, I would venture to say that most people that have gotten into this space and, you know, from, and, and I don't even know what term to use, you know, do we use blockchain, blockchain, web three, web three, right. You know, pick a name, but I think that there's a, ethos or an essence of decentralization that's attractive. And I think that that kind of pulled me into weathering a bear and getting excited because the ultimate prospects of it are so tantalizing. Um, you know, I've always been fascinated by the spirit and uh, Chicago is not going to know this because it's only deep, dark into the um, disco headspace. But I've always had my mythical band name was always somewhat tied to decentralization. And uh, I could give you a chance to guess it, but I Your really- mythical band name. You want me to guess, guess that on the spot? <laughs> Yes, the uh, you'll, you'll never get it. It's uh, but yeah, throw one out there if you get a chance, if you get a thought. But I'll uh, save you. And it's later. your dream. Let's see, disco in the dishwasher detergents. Ahoy, that's not it, <laughs> and that's not <laughs> okay. even close. Um, it would be, and this was ever since like you know, I was thirteen or fourteen years old. I always wanted a band called Coup d'État, which represents oh. a, which represents a um urgent overthrow of the government so obviously something in this whole oh. ethos and, and fascination has 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 kind of wanted me to at some point be able to pay respects to the notion of decentralization and today we're just going to try to do kind of a cursory overview of the roots of decentralization and you know pay respect to some of the some of the big events and some of the figures but really i want to kind of sit back and throw a couple logs on the on the fire and sure. talk about talk about you know where is this going to take us and can it happen and blah 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 so there's yeah a lot, those there's are the big questions for sure i mean i think what we've learned is and what we're excited to share is throughout history you know obviously with agricultural societies back in the earliest times you know everything was decentralized it was these tribes you know but then you band together and you you know, you kind of divide and conquer the tasks, the hunting and the gathering and all that and, and all the traditional roles that, you know, are, are kind of baked into to us to this day. But there's been there's been such an ebb and flow of centralization and decentralization that Disco brings up a good point where 
at the end, we're really going to discuss where's that sweet spot, like 100% decentralization. Can you do it? Does it make sense? What are the pros and cons? And, you know, I think we can agree 100% centralization with a central planning authority. Eh, that doesn't sound too good either. That sounds like communism or like an oligarchy or, or whatnot. So where's that sweet spot? Uh, and we're going to attempt to go through that today and really uncover so many topics and so many uh, parts of history, obviously through the internet and uh, Satoshi and, and the invention of the blockchain. Is this a new era now or, you know, are we just doing the same centralized, decentralized dance that we've done since the dawn of time? Yeah. And it, it's interesting because when we did um, the episode on music, we talked about how there was a couple of moments where decentralization really had an opportunity to kind of break out. And then it kind of felt like the, you know, the centralized powers that be even within the yeah. music ecosystem did the clamp down and kind of shut it down. So Napster, live peer, win amp, yep. Yeah. So are we talking about a series of moments or a movement that's actually sustainable to take to the next level and to kind of break through? And is blockchain, you know, the 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 tip of the spear to be able to get us into that kind of new eco new reality, so to speak. So as I say, there's a lot of meat on this bone and we're going to, we're going to chop on it and see what happens. Well, and I like what you said too. So many people come into crypto for so many reasons. The funny thing is I think a lot of people come in, in like you did at the height of a bull market and and you're like well, I don't know what this is yet but I don't want to miss out it's pure yeah. fomo you jump in and a lot of people get washed out and the curious and the people who kind of want to learn and grow stick around during the bear uh and learn all about it and you know for you obviously in in your past running a music company uh, promotional company like music is in your blood and you went deeper there and then got into NFTs, dabbled in DeFi and, and, you know, interest bearing stuff like, and then all of a sudden you learn more about it. But I think at its roots, and I love what you said before, like at its roots, the deeper you dig, the more, you know, bedrock becomes this question of de decentralization and personal autonomy and, Lo more local group autonomy and being in charge of kind of your own destiny and not being so centrally planned that, you know, you've, you've got to fill out forms for just about everything and get permits for everything, which obviously is no way to live either. So I, I'm yeah. super excited to, to dive into this one. That's a, that's a, that's a really good point. And just to get back to kind of the inspiration side of it and tying it into music. Like for me, just, just in preparing, in preparing for today and just thinking of some of the different constructs to get into again, music drives it for me. And I think of, you know, someone like John Lennon, who was at the peak of fame, you know, at a time when no one even understood it, he kind of walked away from the Beatles and started really kind of planting these seeds of power to the people and, you know, revolution and the sit-ins in his bed and everything. And then, you know, you look at like the Sex Pistols, you know, in the late seventies coming out with, you know, Anarchy in the UK and, yeah. and having that album go number one without a single radio spin. So it's this whole kind of the, this essence of a movement from the people in the underground, but not really the underground because it's really the masses. So kind of that whole, thing is so interesting and that's a lot of what like you know if you look at the work of banksy and what he's doing a lot of that is really tied to this as well so yeah I guess, good point i guess a lot of my artistic idols are probably pretty 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 interested in the notion of decentralization which only furthers my passion to learn more about it yeah it's super cool and like you said music obviously is a big theme of this show even though it's kind of the secondary unofficial theme but it, it just weaves into everything um, you know, and obviously you're gonna, you know, we've got a playlist, everybody on Spotify that we talk about music so much. We had a music episode in episode two, but we realized we talk about music so much in all of our episodes and our love for it and different songs and artists and how it ties into these themes that we made a, a mix on Spotify, I believe called decentralized dawn or decentral pod. One of the it's, two it's decentral pod P O D. Okay. Yeah. So add, definitely add uh, uh, your songs there from those bands. The one I, I just saw um, for the third time in my life, I saw Peter Gabriel play on Saturday night here in Chicago. 
at United Center. And, you know, Peter Gabriel's 73 years old. And, uh, you know, I mentioned in other shows, I am not a lyrics guy at all. But for some reason, Peter Gabriel's lyrics did seep through my 98% uh, harmony and sonic brain. And even when I was younger, I loved his uh, lyrics. Um, you know, he's getting older and he had, uh, he kind of had one move left. He wasn't doing the, you know, the high kicks or the crazy on stage, like antics, like rolling around in a big plastic inflatable, uh, ball. I think he's literally the first time I ever saw that thing now at every, you know, I, I've never been to a club med, but every like inclusive resort, they have those things are like, roll down this hill in this plastic ball. I'm like, Peter Gabriel, he's the guy that started that thing. The pioneer. Um, yeah, but I will say the one thing uh, about Peter seeing him, it was, you know, I've, I've seen we, actually with you twice, once at Woodstock 2, um, and then uh, a couple of years before that at the WOMAD tour, which was just fantastic, bringing all those African singers in. This concert did not rival those at all, but what he did do that he has never done was play uh, Biko as the closer. And if any song is a closer on any playlist it's Biko, and you know that goes right back to people's rights and decentralization and yeah. and the people speaking out and i think through music you can't that seeps into the culture in a way that you know the the mainstream media or just the you know the the primary channels of communications can't really touch because it's it it goes straight past your thinking brain and just goes straight back to the to the emotional side of your brain and it just taps the root and the nerve and and you know music is a powerful way to to make change i think that that i think that's incredible just to kind of go down that rabbit hole of just art in general you know like it's hard for the centralized forces to repress the messaging in art so that's part of why it's so vital and it really can be an instrument for change you know it's really hard and that's also honestly probably why it's often repressed and you know why you have the fcc and all these things trying to kind of clamp down on any sort of expression because right. once once people resonate you know once something resonates and it starts spreading then you have the you have the you have the foundation of a movement you know and that's right and that's got to be scary to the people that are sitting in power and, and more interested in the centralization aspect um I was kind of thinking, you know, we've been, and, and we'll, we know we have a lot to dig into on the decentralized side, but we've been talking, you know, each episode about like what piece of art or whatever sure. kind of inspired you. And this is not really tied to decentralization, although I could probably come up with a way to connect it, but we'll make it connect. <laughs> yeah. At some point I can, I'll, I'll, I'll put the strings together, but I just wanted to give a shout out to a movie that I, re that I went back to again this week and I've probably seen it well over a dozen times and it's the film Lost in Translation. And oh, nice. it's just, I mean, it just, it resonates on so many levels. And, you know, obviously if you looked at the color of my hair and some of the different colorings there, like there is some elements of the midlife crisis that's always mm. kind of, kind of quite interesting at this point. Very, <laughs> very, very, you know, impactful. <laughs> but, you know, I've, I always love the notion of, you know, culture shock and jet lag and isolation. And I think that Sofia Coppola did just a great yeah. job of using shoegaze music kind of you know a lot of the kevin shields and the my bloody valentine and um air and phoenix specifically air alone in kyoto i think was just a yeah. it's just a really cool expression of utilizing that so i may uh tap a song or two of that into the um into this decentral pod playlist so if you want to follow that um give it a follow and we'll continue to update it with each episode and i think with that we can start uh start narrowing our focus into one of the larger yeah, topics. one comment on loss you know i have a comment on everything it's good on. we're not we don't have to hit a commercial <laughs> break we can go it's fine no and our sponsors are oh wait yeah. episode, party. It, it's episode five is our sponsor well, um, we have the decentralized party of and, two thank you yeah and sophia coppola also did uh virgin suicides and the entire soundtrack is actually air there and it's not pound for pound the best air album but it's a beautiful movie i think what she captures the best in her movies, especially in Lost in Translation, like you said, like everybody knows, like there's planning for a trip and the excitement of going overseas to a place you've never been before. Then there's the flying, the being tired, the getting your luggage and that first morning, especially of jet lag where you're just 
totally delirious. And that music, that slow beat kind of, um, I don't know, is it like minor sevenths? Like the, the, the keys are very sad and somber, but you know, there's a little bit of hope in there too, but that that movie perfectly captures that slow pace of like just getting now you're there, like you're so excited and ramped up to go and now you're there and it's almost your body and your mind and everything catching up to the travel and then just the awe of soaking in, in this case, you know, Tokyo and, and Japan in general and being just such a foreigner when, you know, at home you're, you're, a big fish in a small pond in there. You're just like yeah. some guy walking on the street with bright lights and, and stop signs with 8,000 other people trying to cross the street. So yeah, we could do a whole show on Tokyo and I'd love to, but one of the Ooh, things, we should the, go to Tokyo. Yes. <laughs> but one, of the, one of the things that I think is so cool about Tokyo is that it's so massive and there's so much going on but there's so much kindness and order yeah. underneath it that it's like, it should be so hectic and feel so madness, but it feels almost muted to a degree. Yeah. And that works with the soundtrack and music. So, wow. If we're still talking about this and we haven't gotten into our, you know, like the ancient Greeks and <laughs> their, their initial, their initial foray into decentralization, if you will. Maybe um, we're we might... stalling to get like, <laughs> now, now that we're going back uh, 2,800 years to, to go back to the Greeks and the Carthid, Car, Car, the Carthaginians. It's not, the it's, Car Carth Car it's not Carcinogens. <laughs> no, it's not Carcinogens. It's uh... All right. <laughs> yeah, let's get into it. So, so with decentralization, it's such a fascinating thing. You know, I think so many people get into it for the for the Bitcoin or ETH or whatever, and you you slowly learn about decentralization. So we're going to take a look at kind of where it all began. Um, so starting with the Greeks. You know, they weren't using the word decentralization yet, but, you know, back in Greece, it was a very democratic society, um, specifically around Athens, Sparta, Corinth, um, you know, and you always heard the Spartans, the Corinthians. And, and you know, you, if you've seen the movie Sparta, all the jacked up steroid guys are are super hardcore army. And, and actually the Spartans, you know, those guys were probably a little more jacked up than the Spartans actually were, but it was a very uh, uh, oligarchical, which isn't a word, but you know what I'm okay. saying, uh, society. It was very military based. Athens, on the other hand, was very democratic based. They had a lot of sea power. Uh, and obviously when you have sea power, you got all the trading routes and you're rich from all the all the trade because, uh, you know, if you have a port, <laughs> ports make money, whereas land travel for, for trade uh, certainly isn't as lucrative. But there was a ton of decentralization there. They all had their own kind of leaders, yet they would work together to, you know, fend off the other um, societies and, and the other empires that were out there. So their decentralization has been in our roots and our blood for since civilizations started getting yeah. together. But, you know, with, with that decentralization also comes you know, a lot of infighting. There's no central leader to to kind of be like, guys, 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 we've got a much bigger enemy to fight in the Persian Empire. So, you know, there's there's pros and cons. And, and you know, I, I'm not an anarchist. I'm not, uh, I like some libertarian principles, but I wouldn't call myself like 100% devout libertarian. Right. I like, I like aspects, a lot of these things. So a lot of this is going to be looking into like, where's the balance and, and where are we now? So yeah. that's a little taste of, of going back to Athens. And just because who doesn't want to say the word Peloponnesian, <laughs> I'm going to mention the Peloponnesian War, which was 431 to 404 BC. Uh, but the Peloponnesian War, that was one of the biggest battles I had. Everybody's heard of it, but nobody really knows what it was. That was basically the Spartans, you know, being kind of warlike and, and there was a bit of a rub between the, the two leaders there and the, the Spartans attacked the Athenians and, uh, there was a war and, and, you know, it lasted 25 ish years. So, um, without centralization, that stuff, probably the infighting probably happens less. So again, there's a lot of pros of having different societies run different ways and different leaders where you're closer to your leadership. But, you know, there's there's cons of not having that central resource as well. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And you know, you never want to say like the the war with the best name, but if you're going to, Peloponnesians has to be kind of in the top five. I would say it's it's up there. Yeah, <laughs> it's up there as well. So we're not going to go too deep on every single point. And again, I want to I want to just put this out there as well. Our view and our take on this is based on more of the research that we came across, and I will say that it potentially has you know, more of a Western influence in terms of the timelines and, and events, because, you know, there's a lot of things that were happening globally, you know, at concentric times, but we're using more of a focus on a, on a Western lens and kind of the first big step towards, you know, taking away some powers from the monarchy and kind of acknowledging that was the, the Magna Carta, which was in 1215. And that was primarily in England. And it really served to be the first step in kind of questioning the um, unmitigated power of the monarchy. And, you know, that was kind of the first step to kind of paving a way to what turned into the more constitutional models that came down the road. So I guess I'd say shout out to the Magna Carta on that. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is an interesting one. The next, the next point that I think we have to get into is the influence of the printing press. And you know, if I was going to tell my, if my kids overheard me preparing for this show and being like, he's really into the printing press all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, it, it, it sounds very, let's not say web two, but it's, it, it was back in the day, right? Web and, negative six. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> web, what? Yeah. I, I don't even know where to go with that. But, you know, they did have some elements of woodblock printing in Asia at the time. But what really happened when um, Gutenberg, who was a German blacksmith, came up with these movable type options, it really opened up the whole possibility for producing things from a, on a mass scale for printing. And really, it's not printing, but it's really the dissemination of information, right? Like, that's the point of what this represented. You had back before the printing press, really, like books were handwritten, like each of them. So you can imagine the scalability issues of that. And if you look at, you know, media at that point, books are primarily, you know, the primary media to express changing views and thoughts and discussions. Yeah. So it sounds kind of hokey now to be like, dude, the printing press was really pretty important. But the printing press was really, really, really pretty important. Yeah, and that was around 14, just to put these in perspective, uh, we've already covered 2000 years, people. So the Athenian democracy was about the fifth century BC, as we talked about. Magna Carta was around 1215 AD, obviously. And then the printing press was uh, 1450. And interesting, the, the folks who could read were generally religious clergy, monks, and yeah. probably the elite too. So it was very select few people who could read. You know, literacy obviously is way, 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 way higher now. But back then, it was really reserved for you know, the, the folks in the religious institutions and, and really the elite who could, could actually read. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, in a way it did represent kind of the beginning of the potential of the information age. So it is, you know, the printing press was pretty important on that. And it does tie to a kind of one of the next big cornerstone developments of the decentralization timeline, which is the Reformation and the way that they tie together, in my view, is the Reformation was based, and I don't know if everybody remembers this or not, but Martin Luther um, basically posted 95 theses on a church door. And what those theses were was essentially rebuking some of the practices of the Catholic Church. So that was the first time. Which had total centralized control uh, of most of Europe. And obviously everyone's sort of the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, it was, that was pure torture to like, I mean, it was terrible. Yeah. So it was just total, um, the first time that somebody really vocalized discontent with the centralized powers that be, which was the church at that time. And it ultimately led to the development of, the Protestant movement, and that was just an offshoot or a reaction to the Catholic Church. And again, I'm getting out of my depths because I am not a religious scholar by any means, but I'm fascinated by the connection of these different points over time. And had there not been 
the printing press, then the Reformation and Martin Luther's theses would not have been able to be widely distributed and absorbed and spread. So you kind of can see these links building together to lead to another opportunity and another evolution of the decentralization of you know everything over time. So they're all connected and it's just a way to kind of look at some of the lens of history from this perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's well said. The next segment we go into is the American revolution. And, and this is probably, again, as Disco said, we, we're, we, this has a Western lens on it, as you can see, but the American revolution, you know, obviously the British monarchy, you know, we're basically saying enough is enough. You're taxing us too high and we're not your, you know, your vassals. We're not, we're not under your uh, hood there. So, the American Revolution, um, you got Thomas Paine, who, you know, was all about common sense and about republics, you know, which are way better than monarchies. And he didn't write the Articles of the Confederation, but, you know, the original 13 states wrote the Articles of Confederation, and it was very decentralized. You got to remember when the America first kicked off and declared its independence, the states had all the rights. There there was a loose federal gathering where they would work together, obviously, to to fight the Redcoats and and to gain independence. But the if if the government asked for money, it was not binding. The states should do it. And I'm sure politically it wasn't a great idea, but it was actually not binding at all. Same with militaries. All the militaries were statewide. So very decentralized state to state with, you know, the South obviously had a way different um, economy structure than, than the North did. And every state, you know, made its own decisions and every state had one equal vote. You know, you got an odd number of states. So that was it. Didn't matter how big you were. So Virginia didn't get more than Rhode Rhode Island. So it was pretty crazy. It wasn't perfect decentralization, but it was, it was decentralized, you know, but as time goes on with the American revolution. Okay. So you win, you know, in the, the play Hamilton, I believe there's a phrase (laughs) that, you know, like winning a war is easy, but like governing is harder. I think Washington said it to Hamilton, like that's when the rubber hits the road. Like, okay, what, what are we, what do we believe in? And that's where Hamilton came in with the, the more of a federal system. And, you know, he was probably the most prolific writer of that time and how to actually have teeth to collecting the money to raise the armies and to have the money to kind of run a more centralized system. So the States can benefit, you know, some centralization there was, was needed, but again, where is that, where is that balance? So early on America was probably our best example of decentralization. Yeah. And that's a, and I don't know if we want to get into this, but I, I guess we can a little bit further on if we, if we, if we feel so inclined, but it really, it's a fascinating construct and notion to think of how the United States was, you know, really formed with just, as you said, like just such a decentralized core, you know, that was when you really look at it, I went to DC a couple of weeks ago and was in, you know, taking some tours and stuff. And it really hit me, you know, like they were really looking at this from much more of a decentralized way. And that was, you know, kind of really fundamental to the whole thing. And then at almost, I don't want to say as the country succeeded, but as the country evolved and grew over time, there's this theme of becoming more and more centralized. And I think that's part of kind of this thing that we want to nibble on a little bit and gnaw on. It's like, so is that a theme really- you think they were putting in there on purpose saying it's better? I think that they felt that, you know, ultimately as decentralized as it can be is good. But when you look at like, after the civil war or you know when you get into you know just evolving as a country and starting to provide more resources for the people and as your nation becomes more and more powerful you look at the timeline of that and you will see many direct elements of centralization coming into play and i think the conversation on that point is is it 
for the greater good? And does that make it better? And does that justify moving towards more centralization away from a completely decentralized um, ethos? So I know I've said ethos like five times, and I'm not even sure if I really understand everything about the term ethos. So I'm going to have to do a little show note to make sure about that. But the the point I'm trying to make is it started with really strong um, claws in decentralization. And now, you know, if you look at even modern day America, how decentralized are we at this point and how did we end up getting there and why? So just a, again, that could be a whole show in and of itself. Um, moving along the timeline perspective, following the American Revolution um, by about 20 or so years came the French Revolution, which I don't know, man. I've been to France and I love it. And just not to make it too personal, but I there's a you know, one time I went to Paris and I stayed in the Marais. And I will confess that the favorite little nightclub lounge that I hung out in for the week was called Le Resistance. And I did just love the fact that it was called the Resistance. And, you know, I, I just love that it's still, you know, just under the skin in, in that country and in so many places. And it really, you know, the French Revolution was really about the third estate, which was the commoners who were basically paying for everything for the elite you know for they called them the the first estate and the second estate so they were pretty much getting all the benefit and the third estate was the one who bore the tax burden to pay for this right. and you know and suffice it to say it wasn't it was uh it was an opulent time as well so you know well it all, was an opulent time for the haves which was a teeny little percentage of people i mean yeah. let them eat cake right <laughs> exactly um so the beginning of the revolution really kind of goes back to july 14th which is the storming of the bastille and that was when the third estate broke away to form something called the national assembly and that was really as you were saying like that's kind of was the push at that point to give the give more of a voice to the people to the people overall as opposed to the elites and that's at the crux of you know the french revolution from my um my interpretation of it right you had that crazy radical phase the reign of terror which is you know just really can get you thinking creatively of you know the guillotine and everything going on from that perspective and yeah. you know that that's kind of how the whispering and how you had to do the underground to kind of be part of it because if you were deemed part of the movement then you were going to be off with your head you know so it's just such yeah. a um it's such a creative thing to think about and to go into and just kind of showing the power of this 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 movement towards you know taking the power away from the centralized forces and spreading it to the masses and you know that's really the theme of all of this and that's you know if you look at the rallying cries over the years of these movements like it's always about empowering the people and i don't know how you can really argue with that unless you're in a position of really enjoying the power and wanting to not have anything change and i think that in a way encapsulizes this whole decentralized event movement and you know kind of the seeds of it were sown early and it's developed and developed and led to some really really significant you know historical things i mean you can't say that the french american revolution weren't just seismic changes in the course of you know international development in the global you know the global power structure so right. it's, there's a lot there there's definitely a lot there and this is the era in the french revolution where i believe rousseau correct coined the term decentralization. That's a big part of the reason we brought that into this. It's the first time it was acknowledged in his writings um, about a smaller decentralized society where people were closer uh, and felt like they had more say in, in how life around them and society was managed. Yeah, Rousseau was a little bit before he kind of planted the seeds for a lot of this. And one of the main things that he came up with was um, the social contract. And that really talked about the um, how the the power should should be the collective will of the people as opposed to selected elite. And you're right, like that to me encapsulates everything to this day that we talk about. It encapsulates the potential of, you know, the blockchain. So it's really right. about this taking it away and being able to make more of a um, direct democracy and make that really come to life. Right. And then the final step we'll take in kind of the pre-internet timeline is just in the mid 20th century, you know, so 1900s, you had 
you know, the centuries prior was all about colonization of Africa, of India, and so many places around yeah. the world. The, there started to be uh, the rebellions and the the decolonization. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but one of the biggest ones and probably one of the most impactful people um, and, dare I say, enlightened people is Gandhi. Um and his peaceful resistance to his whole point was giving more power to individual like villages and towns to have more say in how their lives were run. And, and obviously he faced a lot of resistance and, and, you know, he, he was a big piece of, of how India um, freed themselves from some of this uh, colonial rule to, to pave the way for uh self-rule and, and autonomy, which obviously every country and peoples deserve. Yeah. And it's one thing I keep going back to, and it's not like I'm a huge printing press guy, but um, one of the things I keep going back to is how information was spread to, you know, get to different parts of countries or areas or nations and, you know, how that information and how, you know, kind of the seeds of a movement were disseminated across, you know, the different areas. And I think that's just a fascinating, fascinating thing to kind of noodle on and think about. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so now we're <clears throat> slowly creeping towards uh, modernization. There's someone in the born in 1950s who was a huge, huge um, piece of kind of moving into the uh, we'll call it the, you know, the internet era, the the 21st century. And that's Richard Stallman, who um, was the initiator basically of the entire free software movement, which was the, wow. you know, the precursor to Linux. And, and, you know, it's important to bring up the folks who most people probably haven't even heard of, but without, you know, Linux and free software where, you know, you don't have a company iterating, you know, like look at Microsoft and, you know, Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel when you're the company and you, you kind of have a lock and monopoly like on businesses updating things like you don't have to add much to, to improve upon it. But when you've got something that's open source that can be built uh, and modified upon by, you know, the masses out there, you you create this huge decentralized movement to create the foundation for um, more individual and tighter knit societal freedoms. So thank so, you, Richard Stallman. So uh, Chicago, can you give me just a little bit more of a flush out on Linux? And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not that versed in, in, in what it really represents. Uh, Maybe <laughs> I, okay. I'm not, I'm no, no expert. I, I, I'm no expert in Linux, but okay. L Linux is basically an open software operating system. Okay. Uh, just like, you know, windows or Mac OS, but Linux is a third party one that is totally open source. It is not owned okay. by a company. I do know that, uh, in the nineties, I want to say a company called red hat, and it was a company came out and and made it more of a business solution. But Linux runs on so many machines for so many different things. And, you know, you're not at the uh, mercy of Mac OS, Windows, obviously Android OS. You know, there's there's very few operating systems. And, and when we open up the discussion, we'll get more into where where are all these centralized points that were hemmed in on. And I, I think part yeah. of this exercise for us was to, to really go down these rabbit holes in the history to see where the show is. It's certainly to educate ourselves. We have decentralized, you know, it's the beginning of the name and that's such a long word. It, it takes up the, the whole <laughs> name. Like it's kind of unruly. It's so big and long, but where can where is this decentralization from uh, industry make sense and where where does some centralization make sense if any so so yeah. that's that's what we're going to explore but linux paved the way for so many more open source projects uh beyond it and open source i mean is kind of completely aligned with decentralization it's you know it's it's almost synonymous so that that's i guess what i was trying to 
get out of the uh, Linux reference and what it represented. So if it kind of had the had the uh, had the flag in the sand for you know being open sourced and, and and representing that as an opportunity, that's pretty that's pretty remarkable for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now we get to kind of we've done the history and you know again we touched on it, but you know where do we go now? What's what's the Disco, I'll throw it to you first. Like what's, what's the, we're, we're heading into the internet era now. So obviously we want to cover that, but what's, what are the questions we need to wrestle with now? We understand that decentralization and, you know, that it's, that it's a call for change and it's a bit of a call for, you know, empowering the masses and keeping, you know, maybe, you know, trying to take the elite status out of the, out of the equation to, to as big a degree as possible. Once the internet came about and, and, you know, kind of opened up the access to so many things, to so many people, it really kind of re represented an opportunity to look at another chapter in the process of the potential decentralization of the world, you know, and I know these are kind of weighty statements to make, but what sort of world are we looking at now and what are the biggest things that impacted? And I think that you really have to go to the rise of the internet and kind of the battle for the rights to the rules of the road in this new world. And I think that that's something that, you know, ever since that came about, there's been people on the forefront battling for this. There's been people with, you know, just vision coming up with, you know, new potential technologies and ways to implement these technologies for change and anchored with a kind of decentralized, decentralized spirit at the core of it. So long winded answer, but I basically am saying that once we got into this kind of internet age, the, the, the potential to really, have a more decentralized world come about really was laid. And I, that's kind of the lens to kind of look at this next phase. Yeah. So, I mean, the internet's been around since the fifties, you know, it was invented by this guy, Tim Berners-Lee. Um, you know, it was basically a part of a nuclear commission in uh, the UK, I believe. Right. And yes. so this guy invents it. It's more obviously military use for, for decades. Right. And it's, it's really about, Decentral. It was actually for the military and probably the the executive branches and the elites to make sure that there's communications, even if there's a nuclear war. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of dour the the reasons it was created. But you know, from a, a protection standpoint of society, it 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 makes sense, right? So the yeah. the the interesting part of the internet, you know, uh, you know, Al Gore did not invent the internet, uh, like, like he claimed he did, but there's a guy, it's probably a good as time in any to, to plug this guy, Phil Zimmerman in the early 1990s, you know, the internet started as these internet bulletin boards and it was very, uh, academic when it first kind of went, you know, went into the universities and people were using it in, in kind of cutting edge computer nerds and tech guys were, were the ones on the forefront of this. But Phil Zimmerman invented something called Pretty Good Privacy or PGP. You've probably heard of it. I love the okay. name. Pretty, eh, it's pretty good. You yeah. know, he, like did, he, he didn't go for like excellent yeah. or, you know, yeah. we nailed it. Like, yeah, the, it's pretty good. <laughs> the fortress storage cannot be hacked. It's, like, eh, it's pretty good. Give it a shot. So, uh, so Pretty Good Privacy was simply to protect um, emails and just keep it encrypted. So, you know, the the government couldn't snoop on it, but also so other people couldn't just easily crack into it. And he actually, what the U.S. government considered that uh, a form of that cryptographic software and cryptography in general. Remember, cryptocurrency comes from the term cryptography. And I'm sure a lot of you are like, dude, duh, we know that. But, you know, <laughs> some people don't or some people at least don't think of it. But basically, the U.S. government went after him hard and basically said it's a, a form of munition, uh, literally saying it's it's treasonous. You cannot ha use and share cryptography with the general public because this is a this is a military use and secret. So he basically, Whoa. yeah. So he risked kind of his reputation and and obviously having the government go after you and you know who knows what else, like trying to jail you or suppress you or whatever. So he made it freely available on the internet. I believe he was the one too, who actually had like, 
some code or something on a t-shirt. Like he was definitely like, this needs to be out there. It's super important. And he got such an upswell from uh, other people and society and watchdog groups who were pro, obviously, like some privacy for people, which which I agree yeah. with. He got so much support. The government was going to, to sue him and they basically uh, dropped all charges because the, again, like you were saying, like at some point you get an upswell of citizens and there's always more citizens than kind of, I keep using the word elite. I don't even like that word, but just administrators or politicians or bureaucrats or pe- people centralizing well, running the state. It's, it yeah. yeah. At some point you have to lift your head up and, and listen, if there's enough people, they're like, well, it's not worth it. And the irony of the whole Phil Zimmerman story, if it weren't for Phil Zimmerman, we wouldn't have Bitcoin. We wouldn't have any of the cryptography we have today online. We wouldn't have online banking. We wouldn't have emails. We wouldn't like all the security and all the logins and the, you know, 256 SHA. All of this is based on having cryptography for the internet. Like we look back now at what a no brainer it was, but if we didn't have that, like what would we have? We'd almost yeah. like every company would just have a website and be like, here's, it's almost like, here's our window display, like, but the store is closed. You can't come in and actually like buy something and pay for it. Like you, you've got nothing except for window dressing stuff. That's not, you know, that doesn't not private or doesn't need to be protective. Obviously we can't even imagine an internet like that, but now it seems so obvious, but then it wasn't. And and I suspect when we get to our conversation, like, is that the, is that, is that going to be the same conclusion we come to now? Or I don't know. Well, I, yeah. Bookmark this because it's, I didn't know the name Phil Zimmerman, you know, and you know, it's, is that representative of not wanting to celebrate or acknowledge somebody that was, you know, a pioneer that really led to all this stuff. And, you know, if so, why are we not familiar with this story? So thanks for bringing that up. It's something that I definitely want to spend some more time, you know, offline digging into more, but you have these certain figures that are so celebrated and, you know, maybe they weren't even upset that Al Gore was getting credit for making the internet, you know, because it yeah. was so ridiculous, but you know, it seems as if there was a lot more than just some pretty good work going on from that. So that's, as I say, there's just so many different, um, so many different holes to go down and, and things to explore. And just to think that there was somebody that was really on the forefront, you know, kind of, kind of advocating and fighting for this to be made available and lead to, you know, some of the other huge figures in the, in kind of the next leg of the decentralized movement. You know, when you're talking about, I, I, I don't know who we want to get into next, but, you know, there's a couple of figures that definitely stand out as, you know, representatives of kind of the next phase of this movement. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and he laid the groundwork, uh, you know, for, I, I guess for me, the next obvious one would be 2008 and the, the white paper and, and yes. the, the infamous Satoshi Nakamoto, right? So everybody's heard of him. Nobody knows who he or she or they are. It's, it's, it's such a cool origin story because it's so shrouded in mystery you know, interestingly, there was a guy, I believe who was a dentist who named Satoshi Nokomoto, who ironically is the face of Bitcoin. And he's on yeah. all these memes. And, and I believe he was a dentist and he lived, <laughs> I believe, a couple uh, blocks away from Hal Finney, one of the original cypherpunks. You know, there's only a group of like 10 guys who are in these original cypherpunk bulletin boards who it's either one or all of them or a couple of them on the side who invented it. But his name is definitely kind of smack dab right in the middle. It's just interesting that there is actually someone named Satoshi Nokomoto. You know, now you would say like, oh, he, he literally had the telephone book and went to a page and saw the name and just said, yeah, sure, let's use that one. And, you know, people, there was a whole, um, 
NBC or one of these networks, like news story broke, like we found who Satoshi is. And he's like, hello, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I'm Satoshi Nakamoto. And they're like, you're you're the founder. For. <laughs> yeah, you're the founder of Bitcoin. He's like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. So it, but, it's, but it's what's so cool about that. And what's, yeah. as I said, in the beginning, what gets people at least, you, you know, you get hooked when you start thinking about, you know, some of these you know how it ties to decentralization that's a decentralized origin story to the nth degree you know and it's just so there's so much to just get excited about and fascinated about you know and to have something that can represent such potential foundational change and to really have it be a decentralized story as to who who really came up with it and how they launched it into the world it's it's just it's i don't know i think it's marvelous. yeah no, it is for sure. And there was, you know, it's not like all of a sudden they figured out Bitcoin. There was actually a precursor to it called digital gold, which a lot of people don't know about. And these guys in the cypherpunk uh, chat room or whatever they had, they were they were working on it. And it actually, they tried it. I think they even partnered with a company to do it. And it was, it probably was just before its time. There might've been a couple pieces missing, but then, you know, that obviously was the huge precursor Um along with Phil Zimmerman and all the groundwork laid before, you know, with the internet, with Phil Zimmerman and the PGP, all this, all these things led to this new kind of decentralized moment in that white paper. And then in 2009, I believe it was January 3rd, you know, the first uh, Bitcoin block was mined, uh, a truly decentralized mutable blockchain that runs as long as you got a miner it it you know and there's rewards there it runs no matter what and it's it's basically a decentralized ledger so yeah and does, and, and just to just to shout out one of our previous episodes if you if you're interested in you know the development of bitcoin up to the modern day you know um chicago really helped to kind of walk walk me through some of the intricacies of the ordinal ecosystem as that's developing and a lot of the things that are capable and that kind of stick out about the potential for the ordinal ecosystem are tied to this you know very permanent um decentralization foundation of bitcoin so if you're interested in all i recommend taking a listen to that show as well yeah, absolutely. And I, I appreciate that. I love I love my ordinals. So, um, you know, it's a mutable art on chain on Bitcoin forever, you know, and it's it's just NFTs and ordinals are changing the way that the big auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's are, are auctioning art like it's it's impacting everything. So it's it's cool to see and art is really the first uh industry we'll call it where i feel like it's given artists a shot to be freed up to not have a lot of these middle people in it, taking a cut in between and these cuts for artists are are massive we had a whole music episode on that too so it's a perfect segue now it, it what's you know we're into the present moment we've we've got this blockchain we've we've looked at decentralized at least we've hit it kind of surficially through the decades the centuries and even the millennia just to know that it's always been there and there's been this push and pull between centralization and decentralization so uh, let's open it up like yeah is 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 decentralization obviously from the people and and citizens and having privacy and freedom to transact which i equate with freedom of speech are we there yet or are we at the beginnings of it so let's let's break it out do we want to look at it from a industry by industry or how do you want to go i think we should just maybe before we get into some of that i think just maybe outline just some of the foundational positives of you know decentralization as a movement just like the building blocks of it and i think one of those for sure you you've mentioned and I, it's a big motivator and that's the elimination of the middlemen you know and mm -hmm. are we really at a point where we're eliminate eliminating the middlemen and i do agree with you very much that the art side of it is kind of leading the movement on that from taking away the ability for 
art to be collected only by, and again, I don't want to say elites, but only by, you know, certain people that are looped right. into kind of the structure and, the, and, and, and how that goes. So I think as a mark for why it's important to really fight for decentralization overall, I think a great overall goal would be the elimination of middlemen. I also think that another fundamental element would be just basic empowerment of people and giving more of an equal voice to everybody as opposed to it being more structuralized and prioritized based on you know societal structure and things that have been so it's bs that people are born into a different position where their voice means more and i think that ultimately a decentralized ideal would be to have everybody's voice be more equally represented than hey i was born here from this you know whatever so what i say means more and in essence i get more and isn't that part of the problem of why when we look at is there really a chance for decentralization to break through and become the foundation it's who's got the most to lose and isn't that always the status quo the people who want to maintain the status quo are the people that are milking the system the best and doing the best out of it so those are just a couple of points that i think are foundational to kind of understand in kind of As the, bull, the yeah. bull case yeah. yeah like the bull case for decentralization i think you got to look at that stuff for sure all right. Well, let's get into specifics with that lens. So, you, you know, you mentioned one, just communication. So let's uh, let's hit social media first. So the, the more I look into this and the more I think about it, you know, you've got like, like let's we've certainly decentralized with uh, communications, right? So we went from the radio and the fireside chats with the presidents, right? In the thirties. And, and then yeah. we went to TV and then obviously TV, you know, when we were kids, there were still three channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And they pretty much all ran similar programming. You know, you yeah. had, I think you had channel 11 by then, like the more nature, the, the, um, PBS. Yeah, the PBS, the more the more public domain stuff. But you had three networks. Like I remember back in the 80s when Fox came out and <laughs> we were all especially as kids because it was more geared towards us, they were more irreverent, but we went like from 3 to 4 and we were like, "Yeah, you know, but decentralization uh, in hindsight, no, but it was it was a step in the right direction." Yeah. So, you know, then you get into the internet era and we've got, you know, obviously first it was MySpace and and they failed, but, you know, Facebook kind of won that game. And now with Instagram, they have a huge lock with TikTok, Snapchat, and, you know, obviously X and and obviously Google with, with YouTube and, and whatnot. So, right. so we, we've decentralized media big time. I mean, you and I are sitting here with headphones on and mics like with this podcast, we now have, it's affordable. Anybody with a phone now can record a podcast and get their stuff out there. So that's a and, plus. Go ahead. And, you know, just to carry on with that point, you know, you had the FCC was, you know, always looking over, you know, oh, you can't swear on a, on a radio show. You can't do this. You can't. These are the rules for federal communication, you know, and the simple fact that we're able to do this show and that we don't have to get approval for the license to be able to post what we want. We operate with our own guide points of, you know, of nuance and trying to, you know, we choose not to use certain language and we choose not to cross certain barriers because that's our decision as our entity of decentralized on but we're not it's not a shove down as to where this show could go we could have started this and gone down xyz roads but the only thing that's really keeping us in line is ourselves and what I, and our commitment to what we want to try to create and but that there's does a social contract too that you know, I, I don't want to get in the whole cancel culture and cancel movement because that's yeah. not the thrust of the show. But we can in America, obviously, freedom of speech, you know, even even in Britain, freedom of speech is not, you know, they, they have a lot of freedoms to speak. But here it's actually written in our Constitution, the freedom of speech. Yet, if you have just bring up cancel culture as a um, example, there are 
social norms that get pressed on you too. And there are certain things that are, have become more taboo to say over time. And that sometimes as an older, you know, we're, we're more in our, as Disco said, in our, our midlife crisis years, but I also like, I also like to say we're well seasoned. So we're well seasoned. Yeah. So we're, we're, (laughs) we're a little older, (laughs) but sometimes we learn from our nieces and nephews, like, Hey, uncle Chicago, you, eh, you can't say that. And you yeah. know, we're, we're good people and I, I love my neighbors and I'm live and let live and sweep my little corner of the universe up to make the world a better place. Like I believe in all that, but sometimes I'm like, oh, that's not the thing to say. So I just wanted to make a point. Yeah. It's not the thrust of this show, but it's such an important piece to say there's, there's what you legally can say. Then there's this social construct good- that tells you and it, it's that invisible cage of wait. Oh, wait, I can't say it this way anymore. And some of it makes sense, right? But some of it as an older person, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. And you look into it, but it's sometimes you feel hamstrung at that. And it it makes you feel like you're caged in sometimes. But is that kind of sharpening of what's acceptable almost decentralization helping to give voice to what's what's how people can look at things or you're saying and i understand it completely like there's things that you're that are just off limits all of a sudden and you may not have the desire to express something in a negative way but it would be perceived as negative so is it because there, everybody has a voice and people can hear the voices that you are made aware of hey I'm not going to say that because you know what? I didn't realize that it did impact people in a different way. I think it's both, but I think don't underestimate, I guess the, the censoring that kind of goes on through that. So let's take a look at the algorithms in in social media, because I think that's a super important one for just talking about decentralization. So again, we've come a long way from the four channels and Fox being, you know, hey, we got Fox now <laughs> to to all these social networks. You know, it started with Facebook connecting with your friends and some coworkers to Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, all of these. But, you know, within those social networks, they are themselves extremely centralized. You know, you got the Twitter papers with learning all about this kind of government intervention and all these Twitter departments that were definitely censoring or, you know, shadow banning like certain people where their opinions or beliefs didn't necessarily match what you know, one of the three letter agencies or what the the US government wanted. So, you know, yeah. learning about that, obviously that's that's it, a problem, right? Yeah, it's 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 slightly disheartening if you know, kind of to say the least, when you have again like a mechanism that should facilitate decentralization to a large degree, and then you slowly see it become centralized. So yeah. You know, slowly, as soon as something they kind figure of, out it, how to manage it through algorithms and the algorithms are totally invisible. So you think like, hey, I'm going to be an influencer, you know, which yeah. I don't know why anyone would want to be an influencer. But, you know, when you say something you want, you want people to hear you. You don't want to be in a vacuum. But, yeah, how do you how do you break through some of these these social algorithms that you can't even see? You have to figure out what the black box is and how to how to break through and unfortunately a lot of what breaks through are extreme information yeah. on both sides which it's kind of mind-boggling but it's just like the news like it's all fear-based and the same stuff breaks through social media so it keeps people anxious like on their back feet and it's not, it certainly doesn't scream democracy. No, but it screams divisiveness, which would 
separate people from being able to unite and really get behind a movement because i think we've had this sort of conversation before and i don't want to get into you know you know making big statements on people's political preferences or views but i do generally believe and i think that we've had this you know kind of come to this consensus that you know most of the people are 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 in the middle more so than they're given credit for and to your point i think that there's the scales are really tipped you know in favor of these extreme comments and you know the algorithms feed activity and you know we know everyone lives in their own echo chamber of their news feeds and right you know whatever i hear is because i responded to it so they're going to feed me more of it and i can build my thesis in case and you know not have any central ground with other people if i was just going off of what i was fed hopefully people can you know take a step back and understand that you know the biggest trait that's valuable now and what i teach my kids like the most important thing they can do is to implement critical thinking when at all possible you know so try to look at something from both sides try to you know remove that and unfortunately this thing that these these channels that were created and had the complete altruistic possibilities and decentralized uh, you know capabilities almost once they succeed to the point that they hit a certain level then they have to comply and you know we yeah. have to, we we've been looking at that as a as a as a new you know news or you know whatever we want to call ourselves a show and we have to make that decision do we want to sell out you know and that's my gen x roots right but mm -hmm. do we want to sell out and become you know, patsies in play the algorithm game, or do we want to maintain our authenticity and not play that game? And unfortunately, when it comes down to whatever people's goals for creating things are, most of the time people want audience and they want the benefits of, you know, having an audience and the monetization of that. So right. they fall in line, which is essentially, you know, the, the force of centralization, you know, yeah. forcing you to do, it, go that route. It's a tough, it's definitely the razor's edge uh, for sure. And we have, I think you and I, having grown up together, had a lot of these conversations about how to approach this. And I think so far, you know, this is show five, but we we just said, let's keep it authentic. Let's be true to ourselves. You know, obviously we don't have a ton of listeners yet. We haven't been challenged or, or an advertiser comes in like, Hey, I'll give you a million bucks to, to preach something that we're not into. I think you and I are, are a little older. So we, we probably wouldn't cave to that. And that's our goal to keep this, you know, as long as this stays interesting and authentic between us, a conversation between us to, to be honest, I think, we'll be in good shape. But, you know, one place we, you know, on the socials where we did a little bit of like playing the game is like the, you know, you know how important the YouTube thumbnail is. Well, the YouTube thumbnail for Azuki, our first show was, yeah. I believe it was Azuki, uh, Azuki exposed. Um, Rugger revolution. Rugger revolution. And, you know, we know a good thumb, a good well-designed thumbnail that kind of pops like, you've got to get people in. So we're not dumb thinking we can just be like decentralization. People will find us. You know, I think most tax we're taking with how we engage with each other authentically is how it will happen. But yeah, how do we break through if we're, we're basically saying most of us are in the middle, I would say fiscally responsible. Everyone wants a fiscally responsible government. So it's not massively in debt. So, so it inflates away. And socially, like accepting of thy neighbor and, and, you know, working together with the neighbor to make our society better for us, for our kids and our grandkids and for the future. So I, I think most people can rally around that. But like you said, the extreme voices, both on cable news, you know, which yeah. is where a lot of this started, you know, all of those things say, like, if you look at the fine print, they're all like entertainment networks, because then, you know, you can't be held liable for, for the news you report to now to social media, where the, the government powers that be have clamped down on these algorithms. So you've got the centralized algorithms, you know, Elon with X, it, it appears of all the centralized ones is trying to be the most, uh, open. And I, I, I think that's true, but you know, the other side of that is, you know, Russian influence in the, in the politics. And, you know, again, with COVID, that's where a lot of people had idle time where 
a lot was thrown at them, you know, around an election year. And a lot of people became radicalized on all different sides. Like everybody got some new hobby and some people's hobby was like kind of going down rabbit holes that there's probably some truth to a lot of these rabbit holes, but some of them were, are probably more fabricated. So, you know, it's not that a pure hundred percent free open, say whatever you want. I think that is the ultimate goal. But again, if people can be super influenced and, and made to believe things that simply aren't true for a certain organization doing it kind of subversively, well, that's bad, you know, and, yeah. but you can't, you know, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of freedom of speech, but like, it's, it's a very hard problem to solve. Yeah. And this is, there's also, if you look at the last 10, 15 years of, you know, the world, right? What was the big, the big, the big, the big push and the big economic, you know, thing of political philosophy was really about globalization, right? It was like, okay, all these web two, right. you know, behemoths or whatever, what was, you know, Apple's big growth strategy for the last 20 years was, Hey, we're going to tap the China market, you know? Right. So every company's like, Hey, now we're, we're opening up to China and is globalization essentially centralization, you know, to that degree, because our, and this is, you know, I'm not a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very middle ground on a lot of things. And, but if you do look at it from a critical, you know, a critical thinking perspective, there's some things to think about from, you know, how the world handled the pandemic and how centralized some of the response was. The shutdowns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to dance around it, but it, you know, you did have a force say, Hey, you can't leave your house. Hey, schools are closed. Hey, you have to, you know, do this or put this in your body. And, yeah. It's a really far cry from, you know, a decentralized. And when we got into this conversation, you know, after going through the history, it was like, so where are we at? If you really look at over the past, you know, 24 months or so, we're coming from an extremely centralized place where there still are all these decentralized mechanisms in place that could really lead to a decentralized world. But my fear is that once things get enough traction to, you know, get to that kind of critical mass point, then there's something that comes in to try to kind of swell it and squash it to maintain the status quo. I wonder if people would be more resistant of those lockdowns and would kind of make decisions community by community or, or, or person by person. And I don't know, there's, that's, that's a tough one to kind of, to kind of tackle. Yeah. You kind of look at it from, you know, the whole pandemic led to an element and an element of more nationalism, right? Because people didn't want countries to be as reliant on other countries for the supply. And that's what happened in essence from the supply chain situations from that. But then you also look at, you know, from an American perspective, you look at how it almost went more federalistic in terms of, well, let the states and the areas kind of decide their policies as opposed to it being from a completely centralized force. So yeah. I don't know where I'm going with that necessarily, but it just, it leads me to kind of think about, think about things from that side of it. Right. And just giving states the options to make the best decisions they can. Um, so if you look at the algorithms again, like we're, we, yeah. I feel like we're kind of, we're hemmed in by those. We know we are. We're trying to take this kind of middle path to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly on all sides and all facets of some of these issues. You know, you you have these decentralized networks coming up now. You know, I you know none of them have critical mass yet. You got Farcaster. You got yeah. Frentech, which is brand new. You got Noster, which is uh, on Bitcoin or more Bitcoin related. And then you got Lens, and and there's there's several more. You know, none of them have reached critical mass, but th they are out there. You know, and. I've been doing Farcaster as a beta tester and there's there's a lot of promise there, but you also kind of run into the same stuff. And, you know, the, the Farcaster guys are, are very prevalent there and you see obviously a lot of their stuff because when you first get on, they want to keep you engaged. So they're finding the best, most engaging posts and they're, they're feeding their algorithm based on that, you know, because it was just, you know, let's say you followed 
eight people and those eight people have already bailed on the, the platform, if you don't get any information or anything in your feed, you're going to bail in two seconds anyway. So yeah. there, it's it's hard to even reach that critical mass to get it. But, the, but one of the cool things about Farcaster is it's you can write your own kind of uh, front end client for it and you can tweak the algorithms how you want. So that I think is the next wave of kind of what we'll see. You know, it, it does play into the point you made of of the echo chamber, right? The, right. You know, y- y- so everybody who's, you know, a Republican goes to this one, everybody who's into crypto goes to this one. No, we, well, we don't want that either. Like, I think... Um, you know, I'm I'm in local government, and I have been in and out and volunteered throughout my life. And you know, the one thing I've learned through it all, especially as owning a business too. When you own a business, you can just make decisions fast, and you know, you can get stuff done because you know the decision stops with you. With with any sort of government, big or small, you you've got to have some sort of consensus, and you've got to get people to agree with you and you've, you've, you know, it's, it's a lot more complicated and democracy is messy. It's very messy, but oddly, you know, especially at the local level where it's less about, you know, red or blue or, or whatever side you're on. It's, it's about like getting stuff done in the best way possible, you know, the most uh, monetary efficiently yeah. way possible for your town. So yeah. it's, it, it actually works, you know, I know. I'm going through that right now in my community. There's been um, some arguments about potentially bringing in extra security due to an increase in crime, da, da, da. And you see it happen, you know? So, okay, the loudest people want to have, you know, a separate group chat and they're going to advocate for what they want, but then ultimately went out to a vote and everybody's, you know, got this, everyone who has a parcel of land or whatever has one vote. Right. And we'll see, like that was due on Sunday. I'm waiting to see the results, but you know, it's not just if you're the one who has the most energy or the most voice or the most, you know, engagement that your voice matters more. And that's kind of what these um, socials have turned into, you know, it's yeah, like, a popularity contest, it's like and, a tug of war, like I'm pulling harder. So I get heard more. And it's like, well, that doesn't yeah. not everyone wants to engage that way. I mean, think about how much stuff is on your timeline obviously you know we're on x more than the other ones but you know the the other ones are probably even more insidious but think about how much content is on your timeline that is just it you can tell it's just clickbaity because these people they're incentivized to keep posting even if they don't have something interesting to say because if you don't post much and don't comment much and you're not super engaged when you do have a really good one you've already been kind of demoted and yeah. and you know quote unquote kind of shadow banned so again we're I, i'd love anyone who's an expert in this the comments like how do we thread that needle of of organically growing but you know kind of kind of playing the game too. We're at the mercy of these centralized networks. So I, I think this is yeah. one as this show evolves that we will be covering more, whether it's just doing a deep dive on a friend tech or a Noster or looking maybe the first show is that that 10,000 foot view of the decentralized options and what it means and, and how can it possibly work. But it, it fascinates me because when you have, whereas with television, it's such a one-way medium that we are literally, you know, what they call it, the boob tube. You are literally right. like the, you know, Homer Simpson drooling, watching TV. You, you, you literally zone in, zone out, and you're just kind of like getting the message one way. Obviously with social media, it's two-way and everybody can be if they want a, a content producer or dare I say influencer, I hate that word, but you know, that's, that's kind of what it is. So, but those algorithms, how they're, they're invisible. How do you get the middle voice with good dialogue, just like a small government with democracy to have those good conversations when there's so many people on these and it's all about your own echo chamber and your and really reinforcing your own beliefs. And how can you keep the essence of an algorithm pure and more decentralized if the influence is weighted in one or the other direction? So yeah. 
you know, like in its essence, an algorithm could be like a DAO, you know, and could be, you know, absolved of kind of human emotion in that side of it. But if there's, you know, KPIs that are underneath the, you know, algorithm, then they can be tweaked. Key performance indicators. Yes, yes, a little business school, if you will. Yes, nerd term. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it kind of it's it's there's a lot to think on that, and then on the social media side of it, it's it, it really is a representation of the society, and can how does that fit into a potential movement towards more decentralization is the essential question. Yeah, well, Elon also he he said a month or two ago that he was going to open. I don't know if he said open source, but he was going to show what the algorithms yeah. were. Now, I don't, I haven't seen that happen yet, but you know that would be great. You know, but I love the concept of a farcaster or anything where you can control your own algorithm, and those things are such they're in such their infancy stage comparatively to the, to the more um, old school social media networks that have billions of people on them, but it's, it's promising. And I suspect, you know, the, the crypto and the VC guys are and Farcaster, at least they're there first, but how do you get more of a critical mass to come to, to really open it up to have freedom of information? Cause even on Farcaster, like, those people who know they're kind of the featured guys, they're looking for stuff too. So at some point, yeah. you know, but a lot of us just like a lot of times I'm not posting, I'm just scrolling and, and looking for interesting takes and news and different angles on different things. So I've blocked the super negative people out there because I don't, I don't need that in my life, but I do try and keep people on who look at the nuance, even if I don't agree with their opinion because it it keeps me from kind of closing off my mind and as my mom called it congealing and just kind of getting set in your ways i don't as i get older i want to stay open-minded because that's how society grows this is kind of a tangent but related right do you think that communities you know whether it be you know social or more based on I look at more of kind of NFT communities or communities related to specific, you know, blockchains or things from that perspective. Do you think that communities like that have a chance to become as relevant as the nation that you're from? So do you think that mm. down the road, like maybe people will start identifying like more as a Ethereum, you know, person than a American. And if that happens, I guess my big question is, are we always going to have this kind of nation state? Or if we move towards a more decentralized plane, I think there's still the need for, you know, kind of community, but will you almost be able to self-select based on your interests or, you know, inclinations and is that then just going to lead to the same kind of squabbles amongst other communities and it's just taken on a different you know format or could that be part of you know where things could head with a more digitalized society and culture worldwide right you're, you're basically asking about like borderless digital nations you know obviously Bology is the one who who is now focusing heavily on that. I believe three or four months ago, he had an interview with Lex Friedman. It was seven hours and like 15 minutes. It was the longest podcast and it was fascinating. Um, I That's a good question. Like, And I've thought about it a lot because I've listened to kind of his take and his take on it is we are going to eventually at some point, some group through probably you know blockchain or i hate to use that word or bitcoin or ethereum whatever it is or nfts through a collection or you know an nft is also a token or a key to having access somewhere i mean it, it it so many things could it actually be an independent nation state i'd like to think in the long term it could but that raises so many questions about protection about 
you know, centralized states having the power and and the military and the weapons, like how do you, how would you get a seat at the table? And that's always the one, even with biology, I'm like, but like, how do you get a seat at the table when you aren't, you know, a, a superpower, you know, and can completely defend yourself you know, I mean, I mean, the problem with like the whole Cold War, it's it's like on the U.S. and and USSR side, it's it's like mutually assured destruction, which then keeps it from happening, which is just weird irony. But it it keeps us in this state of flux. So how would this state, especially if it's decentralized, come in and do that? And that's the the biggest one that I wrestled with, where it would be tough. There would almost have to be a event that we can't even comprehend or understand that would lead to such a change. You know, like yeah. some, something would have to shake the system to that point. Right. And that, and that's kind of, you know, how you look at, you know, the different industries, how are they going to be impacted by this? Is it going to happen? Like, what's the breaking point that then leads to a change in how things are done and a more and having them take on a more decentralized lens. And it may be that crypto, you know, a lot of people say that Bitcoin is is inevitable. Like, I, I was it, who was it? it? It was one of the old timers, but they're just like, Bitcoin, it was probably Andreas, Bitcoin doesn't care about all your politics, about anything. It just is and it's immutable and people are incentivized to mine and it's going to keep going on and on and on so i suspect it's going to come with that as the roots because you've already gotten money taken care of uh but i don't know how you solve for the protection angle yeah but i guess i'd ask this from a so i think that what I'm getting towards is that there's going to have to be an impact or an inflection point specific to the different industries that would lead to the disruption and the capacity to change. And are we potentially there with, I'll use education in student loans as an example. So you have the American government arguing about forgiving or not forgiving student loans. You have the universities just making ungodly amounts of money and consistently yeah. raising it. They and, charge too much. Yeah, and you and I are sitting there, you know, trying to even have the conversation, does it make sense for our kids to go to college or would it make more sense to let them utilize the college fund to do X, Y, or Z? So yeah, start a company or go to community college to get a couple essentials in like, you know, even philosophy in some of these, you know, or yeah. English or whatever, but start a company or start working for someone. You know, there, there's a lot of growing up if you go to college that that can happen, but there's also a lot of waste. And I think the fact that colleges now charge more and more and more, and it's so opaque what they're charging, a decentralized education is, is it almost seems like it's imminent. Like my That's son- yeah. My son has a, he's in a high level geometry class and it's, I don't think it's being taught by a young guy. I just don't think it's being taught as good as it should. And he's kind of struggling with it and he's never struggled with math. And granted, geometry is definitely different than other math, but you know, we went online and looked, and of course, there's a ton of videos. Look what the algorithm served me. It served me someone who served it up slowly and concisely and allowed us to understand the proofs in a better way. And I was thinking like this, I don't want to get rid of, because teachers are also can be the most influential people in your life. So it, it, you, you don't want to get rid of the teachers, but at the same time, like there's there are better people at explaining and teaching certain things than others. So I, I think education is is ripe for decentralization. Yeah, I mean, it's be very hard for someone to justify the ROI of sending my kid to a traditional college right now. You know, yeah, before three hundred grand or something, if it's one of those, you know, a, a more expensive institution, it's a lot of money. Yeah. And it's not I guess back in the day, you know, 
they got away with it more because it represented like, oh, now you'll have an entree into more opportunity. But I fail to really be fully on board with that being the case in this current structure. You and I, I think this is a, you know, I think about this quite a bit, but the fact that we were able to take a course, you know, on, you know, essentially NFTs and and everything. And to your point, get taught by, you know, 6529 who, you know, I would rather have 6529 bring in his, you know, counterparts and teach me various things and speak of what they understand than, you know, the local, you know, college being like, Hey, we're going to talk NFTs. It's like, yeah. well, how is that going to, you know, how is that going to equate? So if you can have the, you know, the best of the best, so to speak, s- disseminating information and people can absorb it for, you know, pennies on the dollar, if anything, I, you know, it's, I think that that's definitely somewhere that we could see a lot of progression in the in a relatively short period of time. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And that's punk 6529. It's a crypto punk. He is anonymous. But this class that Disco and I took was online. It was all about um, digital art, basically, uh, NFTs on mainly on the Ethereum blockchain. But it was also it, it went way deeper than that. It was 10 uh, classes over, you know, a a semester, basically last fall, fall of 22. And this anonymous person with this Nicosia university out of, I believe Cyprus, Greece, they were the first ones to do these kind of online courses. And the kicker is that Disco and I are getting a certificate. We, we actually took an exam. It was, I've been in crypto, for a while and I did a little studying, but it was a like it was a challenging exam and I actually learned a bunch of stuff that I didn't know, especially if you are going to do some sort of art drop, what's the amount of money? I believe it was twenty million dollars that you can raise before you have to go super crazy KYC and dot every I and cross every T. So there was a couple of just ahas. I'm like, thank you yeah. for that information. We're getting a certificate minted on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, and I believe it is um, generative art. So everyone's going to get a different piece, but. That certificate, you know, as as a company owner, if I was hiring in that space and it came between someone with a college degree and someone who had that certificate, you know, obviously all else things being relatively equal, like, do I get along with this person? Do I think they can do the job? That certificate, I'd be like, this guy followed his passion and he went out of his way not only to take the class because most people actually didn't take the exam and get their certificate if someone did that a i'd look at his certificate compared to mine and see how the art was different (laughs) which is cooler (laughs) hopefully not get jealous that he has a more (laughs) rare certificate than me which is a, a head scratcher but how cool is that that they have an online immutable certificate that that is tied to their eth address and probably their ens name and handle that yeah. shows that they completed a, a very challenging course. It's a lot cooler and more relevant than, you know, putting a paper diploma behind you, you know, and the last thing on that really quickly that I think is just representative of the opportunity is there are guest lectures and the guest lecturers were the top of the top of the food chain, so to speak, in the relative department. So right. how do you want to go sit in like a lecture hall at a regular school and get, you know, the faculty speaking when you can get the, you know, people at the forefront of whatever, you know, field of study that you're in. So I just think that that's, that's an area that's really, you know, kind of ripe to, to be decentralized. And And I heard a crazy stat once that for our children, let's say you got five or six year olds or whatever you have that, 80% of the jobs that are available when they're adults aren't even like on the table yet. Now, whatever the number was, I know it was way over 50. It was high. It sounds unreasonable to me, but it also gives you pause. You know, there's so many jobs that just simply, especially when, when, in 10 or 15 years from now, the, the exponential speed of the information age, the nanotech age, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the above, it's mind bogglingly fast. And and obviously AI, it's changing 
so fast that I feel like that 80% number, even if that was an exaggeration for our generation coming up now, it's probably true. Yeah. And this isn't financial advice by any means, but if you were to tell your um, offspring that, hey, I have X amount set aside for your college courses, for your college education, maybe take half of that and put it in Bitcoin and forget about it. You might be better off. <laughs> well, yeah, they might be able to buy a big <laughs> mansion for their first house. I don't know if you'd want them to do that, but yeah, it just, it, it changes the whole dynamic of what, you know, it, but also as having, you know, gone to college when it was, you know, for some people it was just kind of expected of you. Like you, you, you almost don't want to hedge and be like, well, just go do this. So there's, there's almost that fear. But at the end of the day, like I know the type of people I would hire. And I, I, you know, I know Elon came out and said it for Tesla and maybe even SpaceX, like you don't need a college degree. Now, if you want to work with those two companies, you better be damn smart, better be a good engineer. But to me that says like, Hey, if you were really good at math or something, we'll, we'll train you how to be an engineer. We'll train you more on the job. Right. Yeah. And last point on the, on that side of it is like, I know very few people who ended up doing what they majored in in college. So I don't even know at that point, unless you go later in life or whatever it may be, I think that there's a lot of figuring out what you want to do and what paths you want to explore. And, you know, I, for one, didn't end up doing what I studied in college by any means. I know that you, 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 you changed significantly as well. So uh, I, it's something that I wrestle with quite a bit. You know? I was a geology major and my uh, family makes fun of me to no end. They'll be like, oh, what's this rock? I'll be like, <laughs> Lucite? I don't know. <laughs> something, <laughs> you know, and sometimes I get it right. Something, if, if in doubt, I just say it's a quartz feldspar because uh, that's, I just remember that term from back then. But yeah, you, it it doesn't matter what you majored in. Obviously, if you're going to be a doctor, yeah, but even a lawyer, it doesn't matter. Like I know a lot of lawyers who were philosophy majors, but yeah, like if it's super technical, sure, like the sciences, but otherwise, it yeah, it does not matter what you majored in. You know, I yeah. used to be in the entertainment business and on the marketing side. And I get, you know, at first when I'd interview people, my first couple of years, people had all sorts of awesome degrees, philosophy and botany, anthropology or whatever. And then like, they were all coming in with marketing majors. And I was like, no, 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 no. You don't need to major in marketing. Like I can guarantee you anything they're teaching you. I'm sure it's right, but you'll learn, you'll learn in a week what, what you learned in, five semesters there like no you're not you're not majoring in marketing or communications and i'm, I'm sure there are awesome teachers across the countries in those but you don't yeah. like major just find the best teachers and major or just literally just pick the best classes and the best teachers and and you can't go wrong yeah so education you know we've talked about that and there's a, a, there's some other industries that you know you know or but these kind of get to more of the point of like, are they just going to take the best parts of the technology and the potential decentralization and embed that into their own centralization? And what I'm getting at really is the financial markets and the financial, mm. uh, you know, so yeah. are they just going to cherry pick what's awesome about the transaction speed or the ability or, you know, this, that, and the other, and just cannibalize it into kind of their existing systems and really, you know, kind of squash the dream of, you know, true peer to peer interactions without intermediaries. And that's kind of the whole conversation at the essence is how are we going to eradicate the hold that the middlemen and you, you've mentioned it, you know, a few times throughout our conversations, you know, how do you get rid of these people, the visas or whoever it may be that are claiming 3%, you know, because 3% of a big pie is quite tasty and it's, you know, in perpetuity, so to speak. So yeah. let's tackle one at a time there. You, you make all good points. So, <laughs> I get a little excited. Yeah, no, th this is great. So first let's look at, um, you know, let's just look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, obviously in, in the U S I, we're one of the only Western countries or we're certainly the, the biggest one that doesn't have just a, we have a futures ETF, but that doesn't really just represent the, the 
the easiest way to trade it. You know, I feel like since that thing came out, the futures ETF, it just trades sideways no matter what's going on with Bitcoin. But, you know, obviously BlackRock's getting in now. I feel like everyone feels like an inevitable that we're going to get this kind of one-to-one just Bitcoin ETF where you're in your retirement funds or in your investing or 401k or whatever. You can you can put money towards, towards Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and any chain that you believe in. Um, interestingly, what I've heard said often is that when the big guys like BlackRock got it, get in, who, who literally manage trillions of dollars, these guys are, they're not even the elephants in the chicken yard. They're like the, they're like the woolly mammoth triple the size. I mean, they're so big. It's like, you can't even see them. They're like the earth compared to the, to the elephant. I mean, trillions of dollars. So if they start controlling with these ETFs and they're the ones who hold a lot of Bitcoin, you know, you got it concentrated with some with Coinbase, obviously with Michael Saylor, go Michael. Right. Um, right. You know, and then you get the Black Rocks, the Vanguards, the Fidelities. Fidelity is getting heavy in this space, which is great. But if they control it, then what happens happens is you start trading the paper and you're not trading the real thing. So I don't think that they're, you know, and this is one we would fight tooth and nail. They're never going to be able to stop us from transacting from me giving disco, you know, 0.06 Bitcoin for, for that, um, that file collection that, that I've always wanted of his. Um, but you know, you get, you get BlackRock, they're trading paper at such high volume that it can manipulate the market. A lot of people say silver should be triple or quadruple what it's worth now and gold too. It's it's there's you get big actors like that. They can control markets way easier than a bunch of minnows like us can. And that's obviously here's Captain Obvious coming into light, but that's centralization. That <laughs> you know what I mean? So Yeah. You know, and you're in this weird thing that if you hold, you know, any of them as a, you know, minnow little private person, you know, do you want everyone's like, oh, well, everything, you know, it'll skyrocket once it gets approved. But to your point, but then kind of you lose kind of the ethos, the whole essence of it to a degree. And, you know, again, it's just something get to the point that it succeeds enough to become centralized. And is that kind of the end road for decentralization and the concept of it. So once you get to the point that you're, and I went back, I'll I'll go back to the United States, like once that, you know, it seemed like a rough, you know, kind of um, long shot that the United States was going to become what it did. You know, you can read books about the advantages that the United States had just from a geographical and natural resource and all these other perspectives that helped it get to that point. But when it started, it was kind of disregarded. You know, no one thought it was going to become what it was. And it was kind of this, you know, ragtag dream. But once it kind of got, you know, some validity, then it became more centralized. And I guess right. that's that's the thing that I keep coming back to is you almost succeed to a point where then you become centralized. And that was with the music industry. We were talking about, you know, the Seattle sound. It was like, okay, Sub Pop took them so far. Right. Then they did deals with Geffen and they did deals with Universal and the big guys who were just kind of waiting there and and, and snatched it up. So yeah, it, I, I would say that, that the good news is whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, the genie is out of the bottle. So let's say Bitcoin completely got co-opted. It was trading at 20 times leverage just on paper. You know, gold, obviously they're not shipping gold every time gold transacts. It's all paper back and forth. And, you know, some of these ETFs are better than others at showing actually having the underlying asset for the amount of gold. shares right. that they distribute, right? But once that genie's out of bottle, the I guess the beauty of it is not everyone in the world is using Bitcoin or Ethereum. You know, I, I hate to say this, but I, I just heard in where was it? it? Was somewhere in South America. It wasn't El Salvador, but it was it was one of those places. They're using um their most stable form of money was like it wasn't Tron, but it was like the the Maker Dow on Tron or something. I have to look it up, but it was yeah. it wasn't even a chain that that I would even consider. But so if something got co opted too much, the beauty is you can 
you can fork Bitcoin, you can fork Ethereum. And, you know, you don't want to do hard forks all the time, but, you know, the, the beauty is the people can hard fork it and create a new chain. And it says at block X, whoever held this, that, or the other thing, that translates over and now we're starting this chain, the, the tail starts here. So, or it could be a totally new chain and it can make little improvements, I don't know, or have different characteristics on what has come before it. So you can't un cryptocurrency the world. Um, you can't will it out of existence because the someone can always fork it. But isn't the isn't I guess from a decentralist footing the worst case scenario would be just the proliferate that yeah, proliferation of central digital currencies, right? Like, isn't that the, isn't that kind of just represent everything that we're talking about? Like, Hey, yeah, we'll take that and we'll just make our own and make it totally under our thumb. Yeah. CBDCs are, are, you know, the good thing is some States have already, I think Florida and a couple other States have already kind of come out against those. Yeah. Though, those are scary because central currencies, they sound great. And, and the good thing is they can, you know, let's say there's a group of people like a group of farmers over here where there's a huge drought. Well, you know, we don't want anyone to starve to death or, or whatever. You can, you can um, with a scalpel, precisely, you know, give aid to a certain area. If there's a big natural disaster, you can give aid to a certain area. So you, you can, you know, right now it's like everybody gets a check for $400 or whatever. If you don't make over X, like it's a very blunt tool right now, but it could be very precise. But the downsides of CBDCs are far more numerous. And you're, you know, you're getting into China and social credit scoring, which no thank you. Like, oh, you jaywalked and you said something bad about uh, the leader of our beautiful country that you looked like a panda and now you can't get on a train to go four towns over to visit your family. Like, no, thank you. We don't need social credit scoring here yeah. in America. And I hope that that's one, you know, I, our, this show has been to dig deeper in all places, but I definitely know we would want to draw the line at having money be freed up from the government and central control. You want that to be, be more independent. And that's why an immutable money is such a beautiful concept. And I think why so many people come into this space, maybe for the FOMO and come out with like an understanding of, of economics. It's incredible. That's exactly right. Like I came in, I came in at the top, as we've mentioned a few times. And, you know, when I, you know, looked at Bitcoin for the first time, it was at its all time, all time high. And, I was being told in my ear, you're like, oh, you better get in the, the you know, it's like the railroads of America are being built yeah. and you're, you're going to miss your part, you know? So, but what has kept me a student of it and a, you know, active listener and absorber of the potential and kind of just thinking of where it can go and getting, you know, more and more passionate about this topic overall has just been how there are these ways that can really transform how things are being done. And I guess that again goes to the central question of, can we unleash the power of what people who kind of understand it know? We know what, you know, this sort of transactions can do. So how is it going to be able to overtake, you know, the, the, the U S dollar and, uh, you know, cause fundamentally it does technically make more sense than, you know, kind of how things are laid out at this point. Like, I think you kind of get to that point once you, you know, examine it enough, you're kind of like, well, this makes all the sense in the world. So then who stands the most to lose and can it ever really be authentic to what it should be? Or is it just going to get, you know, kind of, um, consolidated and commercialized into whatever way to keep the other people in power who already have the existing power. And I think yeah, I mean, and I think we answered part of that. I mean, the good news is you can fork, but yeah, now let's look at uh, Visa, MasterCard, the credit card companies, these big toll takers. And then, you know, you also brought and, up just who has the most to lose in the government. So, I mean, who has the most to lose? Certainly the credit card companies, you know, 
with their, I mean, I think it's up to roughly 3% plus or minus for every transaction. So every transaction we're making, unless we're paying cash, we are paying 3%. Now you could say, well, it's actually taken away from the shopkeep, but yeah, but guess what the prices do? They go up 3% or at least a percent and a half, really like you split yeah. the difference, but we're, the, the people are paying for it and it's invisible. You don't see it for the convenience of plastic. And now Apple Pay, which is, you know, Apple Pay and your, even your chip card tap is awesome because you don't get hacked as much anymore because the, the number never gets really exposed. Yeah, but the downside is the 3%, I'm sorry, like it just keeps slowly creeping up. It's not, you know, and then you've got all these little companies that, you know, for online sales, like they're taking a little 0.15% here and there. It adds up fast and it doesn't have to be this way. And I think... Obviously, with finances, the Bitcoin and Ethereum, and, and I'm going to lean on those to the heaviest, are so that the blocks just continue to churn. They're immutable. Like this, to me, creates a more egalitarian, ledger, international, global ledger for people to then transact virtually except for gas fees, which can be very high, but now we got layers two coming, but right. it eliminates these visas and MasterCard. And if Visa and MasterCard can adapt and figure out ways, like being a small toll taker, yeah, that's fine. Like if, if you're adding value in that step and their value add right now is they created this whole system. So they have been adding value, but I would argue now that we've entered the the full information nano and crypto age, it's no longer a value add, and I think that needs to be relooked at. So I don't know if the boomers just have to start retiring from office and, you know, let's be honest, set in their ways older ideals and, you know, the lobbying in America with banks is, is absolutely powerful and massive. They, they are almost an extension of the government. They, you know, and, and, in the past, they've they've had to be right because you got to keep things stable. I get it, but now we have something smoother and cleaner. It's new, so it's kind of scary to the old guard. But I hope this new generation of people coming up below us, as you know, people retire, you know, who are who are baby boomers and the younger Gen X and and the boomers kids, the millennials and beyond, are way more progressive in this because. All they're seeing is, you know, Sam Bankman Freed and all the scams yeah. that there are. And there's more scams than there are not in crypto. But the fundamental underlying premise of crypto and the security is it's it's unrivaled and it's there and it's for real and it's you know how many articles have been out there crypto's dead and then oh, long live crypto right like it's it's not because it's not going anywhere only people's perception of it goes up and down bitcoin again doesn't care yeah it's not emotional from that perspective and i think that you hit on what is probably the most poignant point in this and it's relatively frustrating but it's also extremely hopeful if you just kind of tweak your time horizon. And that is, it's kind of, we're kind of in a little bit of a waiting game to have it get flushed out with people with more of an openness to be, and, and comfort, frankly, with the aspect of the technology. And if you're not a digital native, it's going to be a lot harder to really understand, you know, the beauty of it. And instead you're going to get you know, enthralled with the danger of it and with the scandal of it and, oh, right. it's, it's pirate money and blah, 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 you know, and it's going to be hard to change those folks, you know, and if you look at, you know, kind of the development of things and you look at, you know, starting America, starting as a decentralized country, but then becoming more and more centralized over the years, it's going to take a long time to kind of make that transformation, but it will come down to the ethos of you know going back to the greeks you know and democracy and people getting behind you know getting the voice out for this and i know that there's some good um organizations that are trying to you know i hate using lobby as a you know good and lobby in the same way but you know you kind of got to get your our act together from that side of it and really advocate within the system and vote people in that 
are pro, you know, exploring this path and, and, and are open to it. And, you know, if you look at the, I don't know the numbers, but you look at the percent of people that hold crypto and you look at the age breakouts, it's, it's overwhelmingly, you know, much more prevalent from younger generations. So I think you really, that, that really hits the point. Yeah. And your point is basically it's awareness. And, you know, this show is obviously trying to create awareness and advocacy with, with these these groups like Coin Center and and lobby groups who are fighting for this space and and for decentralization. There's there's obviously a long way to go, but uh, I think as long as we're organized, we can we can kind of fight this together. But you asked a really interesting question: who who has the most to lose here? You know, I mean, government's goal, you know, especially when you have a lot of people in government, I assume it's still the biggest employer in the United States by a long shot, like yeah. governments preserve themselves. So they're going to be conservative in nature when there's something that's challenging them. And when you have a digital gold like Bitcoin, where it's a fixed supply and Ethereum that actually has a deflationary supply, that that it, it, it one keeps the government, the more powerful these these cryptos get, the more powerful, the, the more force it can put on the government to have more fiscally responsible practices. Because at some point, that levy is going to break and people are going to go in droves. Hopefully, it does keep them more fiscally responsible. But, you know, right now, I would say the government feels at least, I don't know if I fully agree with it, but there's a fear and I think they feel they have a lot to lose. I mean, look at the SEC yeah. and Gary Gensler. I mean, obviously you can't go a show without talking about him, but what an interesting kind of history. So the guy is teaching at MIT. He's teaching crypto courses in Bitcoin. I think Ethereum was in there too. He He's you know, he's teaching at MIT. The guy's not dumb. Yeah. He's, he's a smart dude. I know he's been in politics a long time, and you know, politics over time can, you know, power's got a a, a very bright light, like a you know, a, a, one of those blue zappers to a mosquito. It attracts yeah. people in and, and kind of makes them circle the orbit. But what an about face that guy took when he took office. So it 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 begs me to ask the question. Did your mind like get changed yeah. as as you came into office, or are you so politically hungry that you will do anything to maybe be the secretary of the treasury? I I yeah. I, I feel like it's the probably a combo, but somebody I feel like is leaning on him hard at all costs and said if if you know if the if the democratic party stays in power you've got that bid for treasury secretary that's that's the only thing i can think of or they've put a lot of high pressure on him and says uh uh-uh. uh like here's the here's the playbook and you're sticking to it and what i can understand just as a i could i i would much rather be a professor you know at MIT discussing Bitcoin and, and doing that, then, you know, have an ambition to be, you know, the secretary of the treasury. You know, yeah, I feel yeah, like, exactly. it's like yeah, I would, yeah. I would much rather be in that other position. So that just seems like a fundamental, something got to somebody. And just really quick, when you were talking about, you know, visa and the 3%, you know, how else visas, what they're not upset about the raising interest rates, because they're sitting there getting now north of 20% on people's balances. So they're benefiting from that as well. Yeah, I mean the they love when you're in debt. I always think like I'm a great Visa customer. I pay my bill off at the end of every month. No, I'm a terrible Visa customer. I'm a good self sovereign proponent of myself and not paying debt. But they, you know, if you if they can have you paying those crazy interest rates, like you said, nineteen, twenty, twenty five percent, like that's crazy. And that compounding interest adds up so much. So they get money on the transaction and they get money on people, you know, middle class and people maybe who go into debt, who, you know, their, their tire popped and they literally don't have money. They're like, I got to go to work. So I got to get my tire fixed. So it's, it's people get pinched really hard there. And I think that's why so many of us 
are so adamant that a new system can come in and handle some of that burden and take away some of that fat in the middle. 3% doesn't sound like a lot. 3% on everything, that adds up. That's on everything now, unless you're paying cash. We have seen a trend too. We just got a little stone slab for a little outdoor deck we have and we needed to cut out of granite. And he check or cash only i think we're the only country that still does checks but a lot of people are saying they might do debit card because i think that's directly out of your bank a lot of people finally i'm seeing it more and more and really a big trend in 2023 that people are they're they're fed up with it because they're getting squeezed on so many sides they're like no we're we're taking check cash or or you customer you could do a credit card but you're paying the three percent not us you're exactly right i've had at least a half a dozen things switched to um, that I used to pay on credit cards, switched to only being able to be drawn directly out of my bank account. So ACH or whatever for the automized payments, which is ridiculous. One of the things that you talked about that I think is really interesting that ties to this as well, and it ties to the middleman side of it is kind of that, not necessarily the certification, but the, you know, certificates and the ownerships there's a whole industry like the most ridiculous thing to me at this point is having to pay for the title of you know a housing transaction or real estate transaction like you have to you should be doing that deal with the person you're buying the house from and you know there's some states and one of the places i lived you had to go this was really weird you would have to go and do a face-to-face meeting with the person that you were buying the house from to sign the title and it was just totally awkward you know if there's any negotiation and thing like that but i it gets me just spinning on all of the the pervasiveness and the subtlety and the assumption of the middlemen within the current um financial structure and how all of those could be you know they're they're going to get significant buzz cuts out of this once it once it becomes inevitable and actually starts happening yeah for sure i mean look at etfs already i mean remember back when it was mutual funds you could if it was a specialized fund you could be paying one two percent i think american funds honestly were charging four or five percent which to me is insane but that's what they were doing so etfs has already broken that down where then but then you centralize more because then the black rocks and the vanguards and the fidelities you know you have to hold in the hundreds of billions or the trillions and that becomes a lot of money if you're only holding eight million dollars as a some sort of a financial planner or something and you're at point one percent well that's that's not as much and that makes it tough. So it's again, all about this this uh, consolidation. But yeah, the certificates and the IDs, like that whole thing is a fascinating study too. I mean, look at, yeah, sure, take housing deeds and, and you know, if I could have a housing deed on my Ethereum or, or even on the Bitcoin blockchain to say, hey, I own this, that would be great. Um, and I think that's where decentralization can open stuff up. But you know, you also have the well. What if you what if you lose your private keys? And that's the I know they're working on it. And now you've got multi sig, which is you know, Disco and Chicago have their decentralized Dawn uh, Ethereum account or whatever. We've got multi sig. It's the you know we have to have two out of the three. It's you, me, and a, a mutually trusted advisor. So there there are things you can do to save that, but think about it. Like if there's, if I have a a hardware wallet and I lose those keys and I lose the wallet, forget the password or whatever combination of there, like, so is my deed gone? Do I not own it? So those are the things where decentralization, you know, I know when we were in our pregame warmup, we were talking about like, let's say I come out to visit you on the West coast and you know, I, I hop in my car with the family in Chicago and I drive through every state. Do I get a driver's license for every state? Or is it nice that my Illinois license is recognized and accepted everywhere? And maybe, maybe, you know, that, that is a license in every state. So I guess from an American standpoint, that is decentralized. So it's not like I have a federal ID for that, but there is a federally recognizable thing. So like the Greek cities, can we actually just create this kind of blockchain-y immutable system that that checks those and not need the centralization? You know, I, I don't know, but those yeah. are the, those are the challenges you run into and where centralization 
is important. I'd say protection militarily and just movement of body and soul to <laughs> to different parts with ease, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's it it seems to be a theme, you know, five shows in that you can come in with a and I, I think if we go back and listen to the beginning of the show, you'll see that I'm very riled up on the prospect of decentralization being, you know, the answer to everything. And I think that just having a more nuanced conversation about something, you almost always end up slightly more in the middle. You know, like I think that there's elements that are as engaging and exciting to me as they were, you know, before we kind of went through this conversation all the way. But at the end of it, I still kind of, I don't, it's not a hedge, but it's kind of like, yeah, but you know, we still want a little bit of this is nice to have in there as well. So it's just, so it's, I would it's, say a little, I, I wouldn't hedge that much. I would say a lot, a little centralization, right? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Just, thank you. Cause I mean, think about, think about with the ID thing, like deep fakes, like with with our social security numbers like that I, I guarantee every American social security number is probably somewhere out there on the dark web. I know my family's been hacked and even even my kids got hacked, which is just deplorable that that would yeah. even happen. But with deep fakes, like there needs to be a way like if, if I'm Chicago online or my real persona and my real meat suit life with deep fakes, like you're gonna be able to literally take this video get my movements and my voice patterns and my voice and, and its intonations and be able to have me say stuff. And now I'm no celebrity. Obviously I have a lot less to lose here, but, but obviously think if that gets in the wrong hands and it's already starting. So just to be able to sign something securely with your keys to say, I, this is Chicago writing this, I endorse it and I'm signing it with my private public key pair is is not only is huge, but it's almost like you go back to Phil Zimmerman. It's a necessity. You couldn't have any sort of online banking or any of these amenities we take for granted on the internet. I think moving forward, you, you know, the, I know the government wants to kind of at least put the brakes on AI a little, but it's going to be tough just to fully rein it in. I think it's it's here. So we have to figure out what, thank God crypto came when it did. So we have the tools to sign securely these messages, right? Yeah, and that's kind of the, the, the merger of, you know, crypto and AI. You're right, it, it almost validates the relevance and the belief in, you know, the transparency that can be provided and the validity that can be provided. So it, it wasn't, you know, it was an odd marriage that came about, but it does work hand in hand. And I think it's definitely part of the equation as we progress down this road, you know, five, 10, 15, 25 years from now, like there'll be part and parcel and working together. I very, would think so yeah i mean just look at the you know for those of you who've been in web 3 logging into a website with a public private key combo with a, a you know ex browser extension crypto wallet is beautiful it's elegant and you don't have to put a username and password and then 2fa it with your phone text message that that could easily get sim swapped which happened to vitalik it's happened to so many yeah. people this sim swapping and people have lost a lot of money or their personas these celebrities have been scammed they've they've been used to say like hey i got a mint on this great new project and send your eth here and you know it, it sounds to the audience you know especially heart and crypto like who would do that but you know, you've got someone who's super trustworthy and always has been and is not a shiller is like, hey, one time only people's brains are like must get mint quickly and they get completely hacked. So the the system we have to logging in with password, username, and then this 2FA, especially to text message is just beyond broken. It's It's got to be better with public private key using Bitcoin, Ethereum, or, or whatever secure blockchain you're using. 
I'm trying to think of where we're gonna where we're gonna end up all the way on it. You know. Yeah, the only thing we haven't really talked about is energy. So I'm sorry I cut you off, but no, it's fine. that's the only one that's kind of super big. And energy decentralization was one of the, you know, it was it's one that's been around a long time. I mean, you've got national security with with decentralizing the grid. And obviously now, you know, especially in sunny states like Arizona, Florida, California, you know, you've got a lot of solar panels, but you know, there's been a lot of incentives even in the Midwest and in many different states for having solar panels to produce some of your electricity. And the beauty of it is in Illinois, at least it fill, it feeds right back into the power grid. So obviously that turns ComEd and these big power companies that are used to generating power, they have to they have to adapt the lines a little, but it actually, when you run power the other way, it's it's kind of like water, it works, like it it works. And I think there's been a lot of resistance, you know, the, the, their utilities, they're, they're basically built-in monopolies because you can't have 10 companies running gas lines to your house and wires. Like it's it's obviously at some point a public utility. It's there for a reason because, you know, you, you can't have 28 lines. And that's why Xfinity has enjoyed such a, a long kind of monopoly in many spaces because like you're not going to run that last mile a ton of cables all over the place to, to get to the home so wow. it's with energy yeah and that decentralization think about it. so if 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 there is some sort of war or an emp or something like that and it knocks a whole grid out you know, if you have a ton of people and, and solar, solar meets such a small percentage. I, I actually have solar panels, but it meets globally such a small percentage of the needs, but it's something that and windmills, there's something and, and we got to start somewhere. You know, we've got right. nuclear power. We have so many different power. We got fusion and, and fission. Like there's a lot of promise for these technologies that are, are once they get going can be almost energy zero cost energy once the thing going it's almost like a self-propelling little little automatic power machine and free energy would think about it that would change the world from heating homes to you could live in more remote places i mean yeah. it's it's crazy how i mean that's that's a show or a series in and of itself right <laughs> just decentralized power but think about energy yeah. is at the fundamental roots of everything we do. And, you know, I, one could argue, you know, the industrial era from the late 1800s and the 1900s of oil and the oil barons and bankers and the railroad tycoons kind of ran the show, you know, we're definitely not in a post oil era, but I think we're at the very baby step beginnings of what that future era could look like. And it's, it's cool that the timing of this with crypto and everything is kind of happening at once. That's a that's a lot to comprehend. I didn't I haven't really put the put the lens on the energy side of it aside from you know more thinking like you know centralized who could have the power to take the power away, you know, and to cut it and you know what happens if you're relying on Wi-Fi and everything from that it's just it's gone, you know, so you look at some of the some of those you know forces being built there to kind of make sure that people can stay connected, but you look at where that can head to and that's problematic and could be very centralized. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And, and, you know, battery storage isn't here yet. So we don't have a perfect way to kind of harness and hold the energy. It's getting better. It's, it's certainly better with cars now, but for whole homes, it's, you know, that's more of a challenge. So there's, there's a lot of obstacles that have to be overcome here, but to decentralize energy is to actually for from a national security standpoint to make it a more stable system and i think decentralization we've looked at so many different industries and just kind of the history of it yeah. the more you have power and decision making spread out to a certain degree like you said with a peppering of centralization the more resilient you are to unforeseen catastrophes, you know, whether it's natural disasters or countries going to war and it's just, you know, like it's it it the rule of law is is not in good shape right now. So there's there's a lot of facets to to why decentralization makes sense. 
And and just one last part that's not. You, I come down to thinking about it as really accessibility and fairness, you know, and that's a lot of it underneath it. You know, there's a lot of big thought trains we can go down and constructs, but at the end of the day, it's about providing accessibility to as many people to as many things as possible and taking down the barriers that were already pre-constructed from a societal nature, right? And let everybody have access to these things that let everybody have access to this. And, and, and that's the, that's the fair way to do it. So, you know, I know that sounds pretty basic, but that's where I kind of keep coming back to. It's like, you know, let everybody be able to, you know, purchase art and let everyone be able to decide how they want to move forward with this or that and let everybody, you know, it all comes from that. And that's where, you know, even when we go all the way back to the very beginning, to the Athenians, to the revolutions and everything, there's, it's the element of accessibility for the every person as opposed to those that had the privilege to be in kind of a different class or a different you know elite elite background and that's why i think it's just so it resonates so powerfully from an emotional and creative and artistic perspective this notion of letting everybody have a butt have a little you know a hit at the pinata as opposed to yeah. you know yeah. other people having it with a bigger with a bigger bat and having it kind of stacked in their favor so to speak yeah i think the lowest hanging fruit if if i had to and you did a great job summarizing like try and wrap all this up like it's opportunity for everybody to yeah. have a fair shake at you know, you know, they say the great American dream, but you know, it's, it's tough because it's loaded. If you came from a good area, your odds of being successful or even at least like a, not struggling is so far greater. So, you know, the lowest hanging fruit obviously is finance and money. And that's what Bitcoin and, and all the Bitcoin maxis and even non maxis, like that's what the aim of Bitcoin was to, to make an egalitarian currency that is separate from the politics and the government and getting rid of the 3% take and the debt take on the other side where people are literally owe the credit card companies like, you know, and, and they can never get ahead because they're the interest they owe is more than than they make, or it, it's a big yeah. portion of it. So money in our lifetime, you know, this, this struggle between centralization and decentralization is going to go on probably f forever. There's just an ebb and a flow. I would imagine. I think the cat's out of the bag with crypto and I think it's here to stay and governments can do all they can try to do. But at some point governments print too much money and they become less stable. So hopefully this, but, becomes, I think you said this before, or in our pregame, evolution, not revolution. Nobody wants chaos in the street. Nobody, like, I, I want my family to be safe and secure and, and have peace and enjoy their lives. And I want that for others. And I think fixing money and having that off-ramp easily accessible for these is number one. Number two, I would say, is like identity. Like, that's going to be a necessity, like our social security numbers and the way Web2 logins happen. It's just, you, you can't do it anymore. It's just, it's not working. It's onerous. It's annoying. You got to use password managers and there's a whole rabbit hole with that. But th that is such a cleaner way to go through things and, and authentically sign for stuff. And then energy and education are the other two. Like those are the four I could see just making the most strides because we've already seen like the roots and the the buds and the plants start to grow and sprout so i i think the goal is then to keep a lot of people who come in for the crypto to get together and to peacefully educate advocate and share all this with others so that we can create a better society for our kids and for their kids and their kids' kids. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't have much to add to that except it's very, 
well put. And, you know, we sat down today, you know, knowing that we're going to talk about a very obtuse and large topic. And we still came back to kind of some central themes of, of, you know, kind of the movement overall. And, you know, just as once you are exposed to, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, NFT, you can't, you don't see the world the same, you know, no. you can't unsee it. And the show is called Decentralized Dawn. And, you know, I like to hope that we're at the dawn of, you know, a more decentralized age and all movement towards that is, uh, is movement that I'm excited to see happen. Yeah. And the beauty of this is that, that this allowed us to, this was our most, this was the biggest one to tackle by far. And, and it was the one that actually made me the most nervous at the beginning, but it's, you, you just see, we, you, we could have spent all the time just on like the, the credit card issue and so, trying to solve that. And I think the beauty is this is our fifth show. It's almost the underpinning philosophical show, but just, you know, Disco and I don't necessarily love to go back and listen to every show we have because after you hear yourself for a while, you're like, okay, next. But this is this is one I'm definitely going to go back and listen to and figure out which rabbit holes do we want to go down because we know it's money, identity, ed- energy, education, uh, and interviewing people in those realms. So I think yeah. this helped open a door to us to so many different ways we can go now. So I'm, I'm excited for the journey and I appreciate yeah. everyone being here with us, uh, as we kind of go through this and, and sometimes think out loud as, as we're trying to be nuanced and, and think about how to push for a better society. So thanks yeah. all. And, and, uh, this was a fun show to do. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for taking the journey with us and, uh, more to follow. Anything we want to share with them before we part ways? I believe that may be a cue to indicate to the listening audience that this show is for entertainment purposes only and is not financial advice. We strongly encourage you to do your own research before moving forward with any investment um, plans or anything from that perspective. And again, thank you for your time. We value it greatly. That was the cue. Take care, everybody. Until next time. (laughs) 